the YouTube channel worked out, so you're going to be able to start. I know what you're saying to yourself. These lectures are so good, you don't want to just hear them once. You want to watch them on repeat. Well, my YouTube channel will be available for you, so you can enjoy these lectures repeatedly. Guys, if you haven't yet, get the book and start reading it. It's free. You can read it online. We're going to hopefully be coming close to finishing chapter one today. We're moving a little slow. We're going to pick up the pace, but that's okay. We're taking some time to get to know each other. Oh, we're not. Guys, tonight at midnight, your first assignment in this class is do it. It's your LinkedIn assignment. If you do not get a perfect score, what should you do? You should do what? Resubmit. That's what I tell you to fix and resubmit. That our first priority. We've got to cover a couple other things too. A reminder this Wednesday at midnight, your second assignment is due, and that's the environments of business. Guys, we covered it in class last week. If you have questions about it, hit me up. Guys, we were going to have some visitors stopping by class today from this club called Enactus, which I'm very closely connected to. It's our small business club on campus. Because of the compressed schedule, we're going to reschedule them. I do want to remind you that at 3 o'clock today, we're still having a Zoom call with our St. Francis alum about GameStop and what's going on with the stock market. Does anybody know, by the way, the next thing these traders are going to start uh, messing with? What, what's their next thing? Anybody hear about this? They want to go after silver. Did you hear? Did I steal your thunder there? No, I was going to go with Blockbuster. Blockbuster would be, that would be hysterical if that one would take off. But yeah, silver is going to be the next one. If you guys are having issues with the URL, give me a second. I'll bring this up so you can see how to adjust that. And then we're going to watch a little video. Even though we're in a hurry today, we're going to take some time to have some fun because something big has happened. Yes, sir. Correct the mundo. I'm going, to, I'm going to go through all that with you guys as well. If you are still working on your LinkedIn page, you're welcome to log in while I bring this up for you. So guys, let's bring this up so you can see. Right now I'm just logging into my LinkedIn page. You're welcome to follow along if you're working on this. Now the question is, how do you get your custom URL? Let me get rid of my messages here. So if I click on Kent Tonkin, okay, there I am. You go ahead and click on your name. There's a part that says Edit Public Profile and URL. So if I click on that, it'll take me to what my current URL is. So my URL, my web address. Uh, is, and by the way, URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator, but you don't need to know that. LinkedIn.com slash N forward slash Kent dash P dash Tom. My middle name is Patrick, and so I use that little middle initial because, believe it or not, as strange as my name is, there's another Kent Tonkin out there somewhere. I feel sorry for him, too, because my, my name has been difficult all my life. But wait, the way you can edit this is a little pen right next to it. If you click on the pen, right here, it'll give you the option of editing what is in the forward slash. So things, for example, if you have a name that's uncommon, that's great. You can, you can claim your URL, maybe not even have to use your middle initial. Some people, for example, will put their name and the year they were born. Some people will put their, their number from their athletic team. You can put whatever you want, but that's where you adjust it. Is everybody able to find that? Does that make sense? Okay, I encourage you to claim that. That's one of the biggest mistakes that people make. So please do that. You guys, what you're going to be submitting, if you haven't submitted your, your LinkedIn yet, you have to send me a friend request in LinkedIn, a connection request, I should say. But what I'm also asking you to do is when you submit the assignment, the way I'll know that you've submitted it, if you copy this and paste it into the Canvas assignment, that way I know you've submitted. Does that all make sense, guys? Okay. Guys, if you will bear with me one second while I reconfigure, are there any, any questions about that, by the way? I'm going to bring up something I think is a little bit of fun, and I'm going to send it to the folks who are remote. I, uh, I'm going to be sending you a hyperlink so you can watch this along with us because it's, it's hard for you to see from the back of the room on that Zoom card. So give me a second. I'm going to send you a link to watch in class today as soon as I bring it up for everybody else. Right. When we do this stuff, we're, we're juggling and tap dancing at the same time here, guys. 
that means doing it on the fly. Anybody know, guys, there's a big deal in Pennsylvania that's happening tomorrow. What is it? Say it real loud. It is Groundhog Day. It's Groundhog Eve, as a matter of fact. If you have not yet started your shopping for Groundhog Day, I suggest that you do it pretty soon. Now send a video to Mario right now. Here you go. It is Groundhog Eve. And so, yes, this is a very big day in Pennsylvania. And in addition to the fact that I think it's funny and fun and uniquely Pennsylvania, the entire economy of Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania is based around a groundhog. If you go to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, there are giant fiberglass groundhogs everywhere. Their entire tourist trade is mascot. The entire tourist trade is based on one time a year, one day a year, when all these people come to see our groundhog predict the weather. They close the schools because they use the school buses to be able to transport people back and forth to Gobbler's Knob. This is really, truly American. So happy Groundhog Eve to every one of you guys. We're going to be jumping in today. We left off, however, talking about the different economic systems. If I say the word free market, what economic system am I talking about? Is it a C? What economic, what economic system am I talking about? Yes, you do. Capitalism, that's right. So I'm talking about a, an economy completely controlled by the government. It's another C word. What kind is it? Pretty much the other red. It's communism. If we get a, a combination between the two, somewhere in the middle, we call it socialism. So those are pure economic systems. The free market is always associated with capitalism, but we also have something emerging called state capitalism. What that means is, for example, in China, they have a very controlling government, but they do have a free market. So the free market is something they're experimenting with, and they call it state capitalism. So they've got some free markets and a growing middle class. Command economies are places where the government basically controls everything. If you've got a true communist system, you've got a command economy. All right, well, let's see who's going to answer this one. In a true capitalist system, who determines supply? How does a company determine supply? What do you think? In a true capitalist system, how does a company decide how much is something to make? Anybody know? How, how, do you, how do you determine how much to make if you're in a company? Man, exactly right. So that's a capitalist system in a command economy because the government runs everything. Who is making decisions? about how much stuff to make Mario. Who's making those decisions? It's the government, absolutely correct. And so sometimes these command economies can be somewhat inefficient. So state capitalism is somewhat a free market, but it's also a command economy because you've got heavy introduction of controls by the government. Capitalism we refer to as a free market. So let's talk about the extremes. We're talking about extreme openness and lack of control. We're starting over here to my right. That's capitalism. If we're talking about extreme control of an economy, we're going far to the left. We're talking communism. If we got something in the middle, we're talking socialism. Because socialism, big industries are controlled by the government, but there is free enterprise allowed at a small scale. One of the biggest examples of a command economy on the socialist side of things would be Venezuela. What killed Venezuela's economy? Anybody know? Because Venezuela had one export. Yes. It was inflation, but do you know what their, their core export was? It's okay. It's okay not to know. Does anybody know? It was oil. And so when oil prices were going through the bloody roof and the government was making money hand over fist because they had a, a uh, government run oil company. Hugo Chavez, the guy who was the president of Venezuela, was basically propping up the economy because it wasn't a true free market for them, for the average consumer. It was propped up by government profits in the oil industry. That's one of the problems of command economies. They also have to be slow to respond to global changes. Not one of these systems is perfect. You're going to be deciding, however, when you write a uh, document later, which is the best based on your opinion. How does economics work, guys? How does this stuff all fit together? This is a diagram from our text, which I think there's a lot going on here, but we're going to walk through it. What this basically means 
with you guys is that money, like blood in a circulatory system, moves through our economy. If we're a free market, we spend money. Like today, for example, I bought an egg McMuffin on the way to work. I treated myself to shoveling three driveways before I came to work today. So I had an egg McMuffin. I bought it. I paid somebody else to make it. When I came to work, St. Francis is paying me to do a service. I rode here in my car that was made out of materials that were mined from the ground. All these things fit together. In a circular economy, what goes in? We have the five sources of, uh, of uh, labor. I'm sorry, the five sources of production, natural resources, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. All this stuff goes in to the system. It gets turned into products and services. Those things cost money to produce. If you are working for somebody, you got to get paid. This stuff goes back and forth to the consumer and through intermediaries, such as product markets. Consumers spend money to keep the economy going in a typical capitalist system. Now, other things come into the economy here as well. I promise you're not going to be quizzed on this diagram. Do not worry about it. My point to get into this whole thing is everything moves in circles, guys. Whenever we buy anything, well, just about anything, we pay tax. So we pay money into the government. The government puts money back into things like services. The, the government also can put more money in circulation. So whether it's the private sector, whether it's people, whether it's people selling commodities, whether it's people returning those into profits, whether it's the government, all of these things move in a cycle together. And so when we run out of natural resources, if you live in the country of Japan, for example, you've got to import almost everything. If you live in a resource-rich company like a country like the United States, we export a lot, and sometimes we're exporting raw materials that somebody else will put into goods and services. And our economy, because this is the way capitalism works, if it's not expanding, it's contracting, generally speaking. If it's contracting, it's not good for the people. That's a lot in that diagram. If you can remember that money moves in a circle, you just learned everything you needed from that diagram. We're going to keep going, guys. This diagram is, I love it because if you wanted to tell somebody everything they needed to know about capitalism, there it is in one diagram in terms of how money moves through it, guys. Well, in terms of how this stuff works, guys, we have to still have governments to be able to ma maintain uh, order, maintain the system, maintain all these things. Guys, how do governments run? What funds governments? Something nobody likes. It's taxes. So when you pay taxes on buying things, for example, everybody in the United States, when you buy gas, you pay tax on it. It's supposed to pay for the roads. When you buy a, uh, a new pair of Beats headphones, you're paying tax on those too. And guys, where does all this revenue come from? About half of what the, the money that comes in to the United States government, about 48% comes from our income tax. And then we have corporate income taxes, which result in about 10%, so that's what we're, we're paying into the companies. And then people pay taxes also on things like Social Security and other income taxes. That means, for example, you may have specific taxes where you live. For example, where I live in Altoona, I pay, I think it's $25 a year I pay. It's the privilege of working in Altoona tax. Pennsylvania, seriously, that's a tax. I pay a tax because I have a job and I live in Altoona. And so that's where all this stuff goes. Where do we spend it? Well, about 16%, sometimes as high as 20, goes to national defense. Social Security takes another quarter. Medicare, paying for people who are older in health care, takes another 15%. Other expenses, that means everything else the federal government pays for. And then we pay about 6% interest on our debt. Guys, here's the trick. Why is this something you should be concerned about? Why should you care about taxes? That sounds like somebody had an idea. It looks like that time is perfect. Why should you care about taxes? Oh, you guys, you guys have a snowed in mentality. I can see it. Guys, stand up for a second. Everybody stand up. I'm serious. Even you guys at home, stand up. All right. First, I want you to do this with me. I know we're behind masks, but I want you to do this. I want you to take a deep breath in through your nose and put it out through your mouth, just like this. Ah. I want you to make that noise when you do it, too. It's making you feel less dumb about things. So take a deep breath in. Ah. All right. And I want 
you to repeat after me, all right? Because it's a snow day and everybody's a little off today. I'm a lot off today. I'm wearing a damn green shirt with a groundhog tie off today. Guys, I want you to repeat the words of Bob Marley after me. Don't worry. Don't worry. About a thing. Because every little thing is going to be all right. Have a seat. Let's keep going. Now, let's, since we've taken our second to center and pull oxygen into our brains, will somebody among you tell me why should we care about that? Lots of trouble if you don't pay your taxes. Guys, the number one reason businesses close in the United States isn't a lack of good ideas. It's not a lack of wanting to do something. It's because people don't pay their taxes. So companies didn't realize they owed money, and all of a sudden, they're getting a knock on the door from the IRS saying, you owe us big bucks, and they have to sell the company to close out. That's one reason you should be concerned. Here's another reason to be concerned. Remember, guys, I was telling you early in the class about when somebody pays you $100,000 for a year, what is your salary actually worth? About 130, very good. Here's the other back side of that equation. Generally speaking, most of us, when we add in our state, local, and federal taxes, all that stuff, how much do we lose out of every paycheck we get? Percentage-wise. Most people. Not quite, it's between about 27 and 30%. So here's the trick. Between the two types of, of government, governance in the United States, when I say this, by the way, this is not an endorsement or a slam on either political party. I encourage you to have your own political beliefs. From a standpoint of finances, however, typically more conservative governments, Republicans like lower taxes on individuals, Democrats tend to like higher taxes. And the reason being is we have different philosophies about what services should be provided. You have an absolute right to have your opinion on either side of that equation because there's merit to both. One of the problems we have, though, does anybody get excited to say, I can't wait to pay my taxes? Nobody wants to lose their money. When you get your paycheck and you're like, man, this sucks. I lost 30% of my money in taxes. Nobody likes that. But without that, we don't have revenue. And here's one of the other problems. If you're going to cut taxes on individuals, Let's say we're cutting everybody's income tax rate because we want everybody to have more money in their pockets. Raise your, raise your hand if you want more money in your pocket. I want more money in my pocket, too. I like money. The problem is the government does not spend, cut their spending, rather, with the amount of money they cut pulling in. What happens? What happens to you as an individual if you spend beyond your means? You go into what? You go into debt. So the problem we've had in the government for since the year 2000, as a matter of fact, is that we never have a balanced budget. We are spending more than we pull in in taxes. It doesn't matter if it's been a Republican or a Democrat. Every president of the new millennium has run a deficit. And so we are in debt to other countries. Our biggest debt holder, can anybody guess who it is? It is China. So guys, where do our taxes go? When you say you're paying taxes, because none of us like paying taxes, where, where does that money go, guys? Yes. Absolutely right. That's why some people are like, we want to be in a good tax base. We have good schools. Because the more money people make and paying taxes, the better schools typically are. So schools, for sure. Where else do your tax dollars go? We know schools. Where does your tax dollars go, guys? What do you think? Who is going to be my next victim? Yes, ma'am. Road maintenance. You wouldn't know it in this state, but it does. It goes into road maintenance. What else does it go to? That's it. Insurance, yeah, health insurance. Some people get, get health insurance from the state or subsidies. Where else does it go? Property. property. Yeah, we, we pay property taxes and it goes to also maintain public property. What's what's another? Emergency services. Emergency services. We wouldn't have fire police or an EMS without taxes. Is there another big one, guys? I'm sorry? Absolutely. We're going to talk a little about Social Security, too. Any other place it goes, guys? I'm thinking the biggest one. What's the biggest spending defense? So to get into, for example, we have multi-billion dollar bombers and, and big military industrial complex. That ta those taxes help pay for that. And Social Security is a big one, guys. Here's the problem with Social Security, by the way. Uh, we're going to ask an answer that question on Wednesday because we're on a timeline. The problem with Social Security is it's kind of built on the idea that there's more people 
paying in, then taking out. Let me give you an example. Social Security, when it came into the collective consciousness, like in the 1940s, it came, I'm pretty sure I could be wrong, but I think it's part of the art we did. We were a young country back then. There were more young people working than older people. So typically speaking, if you have a system where more people are paying in than taking out, the system remains solvent. When, when Social Security started, we had between like 30 and 50 people working for every person who was retiring. Well, that ratio has been getting a little lopsided lately because we, our birth rates are going down in the United States. We have fewer young people, and we have more older people who are living a long time. So as a result, to keep that system solvent, if we have fewer people paying in and more people paying out, what do we have to do to keep that system running? Because we know taxes fund Social Security. So how do we keep that system funded? What do we do with taxes? We raise taxes. How many of you guys are excited about the idea of paying for my Social Security at a higher rate of your income if I live to be 90? You guys are going to be like, kill that guy. He's, he's sucking on the system. He wasn't that good of a teacher to begin with, and he's still hanging on. But the point is, the longer we live, the more we pull out of the system. And we're going to be to a point, guys, we're going to have so many retirees, we're going to be looking at ratios like three, two or three working people to every retiree by the time we hit about 2040, 2050. That is not a sustainable system. Why do I bring this stuff up? Because I'm encouraging you, whenever you have that opportunity, to be able to contribute to your retirement that I hope that you do so. We're doing pretty good on this stuff today, guys. We're moving pretty quickly. We're going to start talking about the business cycle. We've got a, like a five-minute lightning round that we're going to go through here. doesn't mean we're going to blaze over anything, but we're going to hit a lot of concepts very quickly because we're talking about business cycles. We're talking about the natural state of the economy. We're also going to talk about the unemployment rate and how inflation works. Oh, exciting stuff. I love this stuff. Guys, right now, in the United States, because of COVID-19, our economy did this. And that's, that's called contraction. That's not something we want. Does anybody know, by the way, what rate did the U.S. economy contract in 2020? About 3%. That doesn't sound like much until you realize how big our economy is. How, we, we talk about gross domestic product. I promise this fits in. GDP. That means if, if the United States economy if I were the United States economy, I'd be wearing red, white, and blue instead of green. But if I were the United States economy, all the blood moving through my veins would be the money that goes through the economy. So money is what funds GDP. GDP, the amount of money moving through our ecosystem, our economic ecosystem, is blood in the veins. Anybody know how big our GDP was at the beginning of the pandemic? Yes. I'll give you a hint, it's in trillions. How big is our economy? Yes. Yes. Not, not that big, that's a good guess. We're, depending on estimates, we're going between about 21 and 23 trillion dollars. A 3% contraction of that is a substantial amount of money. That's nothing to sneeze at. So the very fact that we're in a recession right now, or coming out of a recession, is a pretty big deal. We're going to talk about how that stuff works. So again, this is, uh, these, are, these are numbers from the end of the, the good times. We're looking at about 21 trillion, depending on who you're talking about. China is right behind us at 14 trillion, and they're back to an expansion of their economy again. I'm here to tell you without changes. And I'm not saying you should care about it. I care about it. But guys, within your lifetime, if this trend does not change, the United States will not be the biggest economy in the world. China will. And they're growing at a faster rate. They've got more young consumers. And they are putting more money into their infrastructure and economy. We have a shot at seeing somebody else take the number one spot. That's something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. But it could absolutely happen. There are four phases to the economic cycle, guys. The first thing we have is a boom. A boom means something big happened, like a side boom. In the 90s, it was the Internet. In the early 2Ks, it was smartphones. It was something. It makes people want to buy stuff and put money into the economy. Then we have a recession. And that means we're two quarters, three months, three months, three months out of a year is a quarter, that we have a uh, reduction in the amount of GDP. 
So we're contracting for two quarters. If we go beyond two quarters, we get into what's called a depression. And so that means that the recession never seems to end. There are some people that argue in 2008 when the housing market crashed, we were in a depression. And then we start clawing our way out, and that's called a recovery. And that's where we are right now. We're getting back out of that hole. Those are the four phases in a business cycle. So, <clears throat> double dipping is bad. You don't want to be that person at the party. But seriously, get a chip. Chips are cheap, right? Why do people feel the need to dip for this? Come on, you know, show a little crack. Put it in once, take it to you. Um, am I right? Double dipping is gross. It's a double dip, especially now with COVID. Well, a double dip recession is also something people don't like. That means, for example, we are clawing our way out of a, of, of a recession. We've had two quarters where things are looking good, and we slide back down the hole. Think about it this way. Think about yourself sitting on the bottom of a hole, and it's muddy, and it's terrible, and you've clawed your way out of it, and you slide back in. What does that do to your morale? It kills it. Hey, I thought we were out of this. I thought we were out of this problem. Think about this, guys. When we got to the summer, and we thought we were getting better from COVID, and we go back into quarantines, that hit people hard in the psyche. And again, a double dip recession is hard on people's psyches too. This isn't in our text. I include this because you'll hear this on CNBC a good bit of the time. So there are, there are some folks who still believe that we're in a recession. Guys, right now, if you're a white collar job and you can work from home, is 2020 not so bad for you? Some people save money in 2020. Like, for example, what didn't you have to spend money on if you worked a white-collar job that allowed you to work from home? You didn't have to spend gas. What else? Got to eat out. Eat out, for sure. You didn't have to buy ties and nice work clothes because you're working in your bathroom. And all of a sudden, people aren't spending money eating out or going out, and they're sacking money away. In fact, a lot of people in the white-collar industries have better savings accounts than they did at the beginning of 2020. Who is this hitting like crazy? Who is not benefiting from COVID-19? Small businesses. Excellent. Who else? People in the restaurant service industry. These people get killed. And so you've got a recovery on top of a depression right now. So you've got a greater income divide, a divide now in 2021 than we had before the pandemic. That's not good news. And that means, number one, we've got to find our way out of this pandemic. But number two, we've got to start also evaluating how do we train people so that they have more flexible career paths that are going to be resilient in the face of these kinds of obstacles? All right, guys, well, here's the deal. If I can get one solid question or statement or a very strange noise, I would be willing to end class a little early today because we're on a rapid schedule. So who is asking a question, making a statement, or making a strange noise for the rest of us? Sir? How long did it take you to show your graph? I got up at 6 a.m. and I shoveled at 7.30. I did my driveway and two of my neighbors' driveways. I'm done with my workout for today. Guys, have a wonderful day.